It's time to take an inside look at those that are taking their lives, their businesses, and their passions to the next level. Get ready to thrive loud with Lou Diamond. Welcome everyone to another episode of Thrive Loud with Lou Diamond, connecting you to the most inspiring and amazing people that are thriving each and every day. I am your host, Lou Diamond, and our guest today is Alan Arakel. Alan Arakel is an entrepreneur, philanthropist, investor, trader, and firm believer in the possible. A public school kid who has lived around the world, worked for the greatest mentors, and is passionate about giving people a chance. Alan has over 25 years of unique global capital markets expertise. Alan has experience in both investing and running operations on the ground floor, on the ground, excuse me, in four countries, including a wide range of responsibilities across trading, portfolio management, product development, execution, and strategic client coverage. Prior to founding Shamana, Alan was managing director and chief operating officer of Bank of America's entire India franchise. Based in Mumbai, he oversaw the daily operations of 700 employees in six lines of businesses across five offices. Oof. Uh, the perpetual search for balance between the old and the new, the fast and the slow, between local and global, as well as those who have it all and those who have little is what drives Alan Arakel and Shamana. I am honored and proud to welcome Alan Arakel to the Thrive Loud podcast. Alan, how are you, my friend? Oh my God, I am fabulous. And with an intro like that, how can I not be? Uh, that was spectacular. You should bounce that credit right back to you. I'm only uh, stating what is who you are and all the things that you have been, which is only a, a sliver of the great things that you are doing and why you are on this Thrive podcast to share with everybody those reasons. So, Alan, one of the things I do at the beginning of every show is I like to uh, let the people know exactly how I have a personal connection to you and my, and I like sharing that at this point in the show. So, if you bear with me for a minute, I'll, I'll tell our listeners on Thrive Loud our story. So we, so, we met at B of A Merrill when he joined after coming over from Goldman Sachs. Uh, Alan and I were the same age, which means we're both exactly a little over 29. Uh, <laughs> Alan is originally from Queens, New York, and while I was born in Brooklyn, I grew up in Rockaway Beach, Queens, so we have that going. Uh, after Alan headed to India and I moved on to start thriving, that's me putting quotes around that, uh, we reconnected when he returned stateside and had launched Shamana. When I learned what you're going to learn today about Shamana and the unique company that he has created, it's hard not to love what it's all about. I was absolutely drawn to it. We actually started working together, which we'll touch on in this show, I'm certain. And in that time, our families have gotten to know each other. And maybe most importantly, <laughs> his family spent some time at my home to see what having a dog was all about. <laughs> and they got to meet my beloved Rocky, who is a wonderful, very handsome-looking cockapoo. And uh, this led uh, Alan's family to add a puppy of their own, uh, Teddy, to yeah. their clan, which I know has added so much joy and fun to the Arakel's uh, family. I thought of doing a dog cast, Alan, uh, for this episode. <laughs> However, I controlled myself, which is the least I could say about my dog running around. But I'm glad to have you here and glad to share with everybody our, uh, our little connection. Thank you for being here today. I am so happy and honored and uh, I'm just over the moon to be here. And I, you know, when you recap all those different connections, it's amazing, whether it's the Brooklyn Queens thing, whether it's our time in fixed income and interest rates at Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, um, coupled to how our, we've become very good family friends now. And then to top it off, the cockapoo connection, I got to tell you, it's meant to be. Well, for the listeners out there, it's even more close than you think, because technically we are family. Because R Rocky, <laughs> I believe, is Teddy's uncle through a couple of layers in there. So there's some, some connection to that. It's which just is unbelievable. It's just unbelievable. Our wives will be so glad that this was the way we kicked off this uh, podcast interview. <laughs> All right. So let's get back to business and uh, talk about thriving a little bit. And let's start out by talking about Shamana Capital, why you created it, and your journey to this point. 
Absolutely. I'd love to do that. Um, you know, and thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Um, and, you know, we talk a lot about what we're doing every day. We get caught up in, you know, the day to day grind and all that stuff. But sometimes it's really important to kind of step back and think about the big picture of of kind of where we've been, where we came from, what are we doing today and where are we trying to go and what are we trying to do? Um, and that gives me a lot of perspective. And I've thought a lot about this, as you can tell already about about all these things and gives me a lot of perspective of where I want to go. And let me t- articulate a little bit about the reasons for Shamana. I mean, a- as you just very well said, I am a very, very fortunate individual for a whole host of reasons. A kid born in India, lucky enough to immigrate over to the United States, moved to Brooklyn when I was very young, lived there for a couple of years, actually. So even another thing we have in common, Didn't know but that. basically grew up in Queens. Yep. Uh, once again, a public school kid from Queens went to a state school in New York and was just given just so many great opportunities in life. Um, went to Binghamton, graduated, got an opportunity to join this small little private investment bank with 6,000 people called Goldman Sachs in downtown <laughs> Manhattan. Started with them in New York. And, and actually, I started off in technology. I mean, thank God I was you know lucky enough to get access to a computer science background, a little bit of finance, the two things I was really interested in as a kid. Um, um, and got a chance writing, you know, trading systems for this stuff that I had no idea about called government bonds um, and learned what U.S. Treasuries were. And, you know, when you actually have to write a program that calculates every single piece of a bond and how it works and, and how to trade it and how it goes from a trader to a salesperson, I mean, there's no better way to learn a business from the ground up. And, and that's where I was lucky enough and fortunate enough to be able to learn and do and from that, I got an opportunity to move up to the trading desk, um, worked as a trader for fixed income securities, um, uh, short term interest rates in New York. And with that, was lucky enough to move over uh, at a very early stage in my career, both in age and seniority, to move to Japan. Um, you know, and once again, for a kid from Queens, Japan literally is the other side of the world um, and traded interest rates in Japan. I mean, I didn't speak a word of Japanese, let alone know what Japanese interest rates were or how any of that stuff worked. Um, did that for a couple of years with Goldman um, and then was fortunate enough once again to move to London. Um, and all along, you know, at Goldman Sachs, a really spectacular firm, really spectacular culture and really learned stuff from the ground up across fixed income and about markets and clients and, and just really kind of continue to grow my interest in all of these different pieces. Um, and then after practically a lifetime at Goldman, which was 12 years, I got went on to the next leg of my journey. Um, so jumping real quick, after a two-year hiatus in California, I got to spend two years at uh, John Merriweather's shop in Greenwich, Connecticut. Um, I was lucky enough to bring us here and where we still currently live and we call home. I uh, did two years at a startup hedge fund um, called Outpost Investment Group with some really fabulous friends friends and partners, and uh, five years at Bank of America, of which, as you said, um, three and a half of them was in India um, with a really a life-changing experience um, in terms of helping to run a business, but also personally and professionally for myself and my family, um, just a, a whirlwind in terms of change and experience and growth and development and really planted a lot of the seeds of, of kind of where I am today. Um, so did that um, till about 2015, till about 2014, mm-hmm. when we came back to the U.S. And I really thought about kind of how do I put all of these incredible experiences together, um, and how do I kind of chart out the 10, 20, 30 years of my life of what's important to me? What do I want to spend my time and bandwidth and experience doing? Um, and it really kind of came together with this concept of shamana. Shamana is a Sanskrit word for balance. And it's really kind of how do you put all these pieces together? And it's a little bit of the proverbial work-life balance of what's important to my family and what's important to me. A little bit of what do I like doing? So I like being near markets. I like trading and investing, but I also like building businesses and running businesses. How can I do all those together? But most importantly is, you know, how do I take all of this incredible goodwill and good fortune I've had in terms of opportunities and lever that up, not only for what I want to do professionally and what I think I can do, and couple that with what can I do to give back? Because those three years in India really, you know, kind of 
put together a big concept of, you know, whether you call it philanthropy or giving. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been doing it kind of my whole career and life, but it's really taking what I've done and what I've built and, you know, kind of how can we leverage that and, and, and turn that back into giving. And, you know, I got access to uh, one, you know, having being of Indian ethnicity, but also seeing the incredible opportunity I've had and how little opportunity people don't have or, or have access to and how can we turn that. So long story short, I decided to embark on this venture of Shamana. Which is really one, create a fund platform, which is Shamana Capital Management, um, build the flagship fund and launch that, which is Shamana's Global Macro Fund, which is, uh, you know, what I will be the portfolio manager, trader and chief investment officer for. But then on the side of that is create its own tax exempt, what the, in tax speak, a 501c3 foundation called Shamana Giving, which will take a, a relatively large percentage. It's going to be somewhere around 25% of the management fees that comes into this entity, which, you know, is de minimis now, but we have all the vision of doing it. And we'll, it'll go into Shamana Giving, and that will make allocations every year to partners that I've gotten to know over the years that work with sustainable impact investing to tackle poverty around the world. And there's some, relative, some phenomenal groups that I've gotten to know and work with. And that's kind of the long story short of, of, of where we are with, you know, what Shamana is. It's a fun platform, but also has a tax exempt foundation and really kind of incorporates in many ways the concept of balance. You know, it's it's perfect, and it, and it fits your why, your super why. You know, living and breathing <laughs> what you do every day, and and that description of understanding. You know, all the different places you've come in your life. I actually love. We'll talk about it at the at the at the end of the show notes, and, and we'll provide the link. Uh, the Shamana Capital website features a lot of bridges in all of the places uh, that Alan has lived in his life, which which I love because. Obviously, I'm all about connection, so bridges do connect things. Yeah. It's also, though, a, a great metaphor for, for linking these two worlds together, uh, yeah. link, linking the financial component of the world that we think of from the investment side, but also the ability to give back to the stuff that's important and that prioritization and importance of that in your life to be able to do that in the space that you're in is great. And I, I think that is something that uh, I applaud you for and, and others others should as well. It is noble but it's also very Alan Arakel for those who get to know him. This is exactly what he's about. And, and thank you for sharing that story of just how it's, it's all come to that point. I want to bring these bridges up in, into my, my next question, which is, obviously, you have moved a lot in your life. Uh, and <laughs> yes. I, I, I want to say this. We talked earlier, by the way, that's so funny that, that not only that you grew up in Brooklyn and then moved to Queens, uh, which I did, obviously, at a very early age, uh, the same thing there. Side note, I also worked in technology and financial services first when I came out of college. So we had that in common, which I didn't know until, until we just did this call. Uh, the, the piece that I wanted to talk about, though, were all of these moves. Moves can be challenging. Um, they shake you up. They can alter your perspective of things and also kind of be unsettling. Uh, I'll be honest, when I moved from when my parents moved from Queens to Long Island, I still hold guilt to them to this day for you know taking me away from my friends. How have you been able to handle all of these moves around the world? Did, did you look forward to them? Did you see them as great opportunities or did you find them to be unsettling in your life? You know, that's a really good question, Lou. And, you know, at, at the risk of sounding a little <laughs> screwed up, I, there's a famous saying, ignorance is bliss. You know, uh, <laughs> a, a, a part of it is the, all of these original moves, whether you call it from India to Kuwait, Kuwait to a little bit of time in Switzerland to eventually Brooklyn when I was seven years old and to Queens when I was 12. You know, you kind of get carted along with your parents and you're, you're effectively, a, you know, the piece of luggage coming along. So you don't really have a choice <laughs> or a say and you're you're going for the ride and, and what a ride it was. Um, and then, you know, whether it's you're going to, you know, moving to Queens and then going away to college, or those are all changes and you put them in perspective. The Tokyo gig, you know, I, I had no idea except that it was one of these things where something in your gut, something in your system just told you this is the right thing to do and to trust your gut. I mean, I've always had an interest in Japan um, for some reason. Now, part of it is, you know, when the times that we went, the time that we went to college, you know, Japan was a massive force. And 
I remember those kids that were lucky enough to go do exchange programs in Japan. I remember kids who studied Japanese in school. And then, you know, we also grew up in New York at a time when the Japanese bought Rockefeller Center. So there was always this kind of calling to learn about this, you know, this very interesting culture and market and economy. It was obviously at, you know, a different stage of their business cycle. But when that came up, it was just something that was compelling about it. Part of it was ignorance and naivete. Part of it was, you know, the, the thrill of the unknown and let's go for it and fortunately i was uh uh, i married a a phenomenal person um who was up for the adventure we were just literally six months married at the time and i came home and i said hey i got this gig with goldman to let's go move to japan and thankfully she didn't shut the door in my face and was up for the adventure (laughs) and you know and here we are 20 plus something years later and we're still going on adventures so yeah, and that was easy because it was just the two of us, um, and it was a job. It was a much bigger job, so from a from a commercial standpoint and professional standpoint, it made sense. Uh, we went from you know probably a, a four hundred square foot apartment in Greenwich Village, New York, to uh, to you know a nice expat apartment in the center of Tokyo. So it made a lot of sense. It, it made that transition a lot easier. Um, but then you know it's when you land there you realize how much how little you know and the whole adventure process begins again and I've been fortunate enough to love that adventure process and and blessed enough that nothing has terribly gone wrong <laughs> you know uh, and, and stuff like that and I'll tell you ordering food in a place where you don't speak the language is is very challenging in many many ways <laughs> let me tell you um, ordering the food sometimes when you do speak the language can be equally yeah. as challenging you have no correct, idea what you're doing right so yeah so we did that and then obviously every move has been you know compounded on top of in terms of adventure and growth um also gets a little bit more challenging with when we moved to london we were you know we were carrying we we're pregnant with our first child when we moved from london we had a child and and pregnant with a second mm-hmm. and then you know back to the east coast we had two kids and then india was you know, with three kids so you know the, every one of those and then obviously the professional pieces grow as well with that so they're more challenging in terms of complexity and multiple dimensions to address but i think that's what keeps things interesting um you know some of our friends have gone as far to say that they they think we have geographic add with respect to <laughs> you know having lived somewhere three to four years and this like itch coming up to to kind of go somewhere else so you know the goods and bads that go with that well m- maybe this is me me leading the question but i, I also think that it it's probably true not many people get it an opportunity to have the global perspective that you have had in your career. And I think that has probably helped you in really having a keen eye for global markets and that global view for your fund. First of all, let, let's talk a little markets here. Give us give us your take on that, your experience in living all over the world and how that's helped you better understand global markets. And also how you're seeing things right now, the way the economy is going. Um, we're about a third of the way through 2017. Talk to us about, you know, where you where you see trends and things are going from that perspective. I know that was a lot to throw in one no, question. No, 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 no. That's I absolutely I mean this Yeah, <laughs> thank you. And and look, this is the stuff I love. Uh I think, you know, at at, at the risk of being a little bit too 10, 20,000 feet ish, we're coming in into a very interesting period in the cycle where you're 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 really recovering globally from the financial crisis, um, not the depression, but the big the great financial crisis of two thousand seven, eight, and nine. And uh, we're a full ten years into that, and we're coming to the period of using the famous words of we're removing the global punch bowl. Um, we saw it in the U.S. first. You're starting to see it a little bit in Europe. You're you're potentially might be seeing it in Japan, and also the ripple effects throughout emerging markets. So the ten years of quote unquote stimulus. Um, we're starting to take that away and you're going to feel some massive changes uh, through the system and some of those will be hangover related and some of those will be uh, you know positive in terms of being able to stand on your own feet I think the primary driving force is how those different pieces affect the US dollar and I say the US dollar because it is the reserve currency it still is the reserve currency um, and the ripple effects that how the dollar gets affected will affect all the asset classes in all of the different regions differently. So it makes it an incredibly compelling and interesting time in global macro investing. So whether you're looking at 
artificially um, low yields both in the U.S. Um, and in Europe by central bank policy and obviously what the, the Japanese central bank has done with their policy that's been in place the longest. And if you look at risk assets, you look at equity prices, you look at you know real estate, you look at um, venture capital and private equity and all of these different investments, you're going to see ripple effects through all of those going through and it's going to be very, very interesting. Now you have that perspective of financial assets and risk assets, as I like to call them, and couple that with politics. I mean, you are seeing things that we haven't seen in the last 20 to 30 years on a global basis. And three thematic concepts. I mean, I I don't need to talk at all, but everybody knows and is aware of the rise of populism. We first saw it um, in England with the Brexit vote, and it transitioned slowly over into the United States with the the election of Donald Trump, Um, two concepts that we've never really seen or experienced in a very, very long time, and certainly in a lot of people's lifestyles. Um, you are seeing the rebirth or reinitiation of the concept of nationalism um, mm-hmm. versus globalization, but you're also doing it at a time when globalization is really very, very well developed. I mean, uh, if you go back to the Thomas Friedman book, uh, the, the World is Not Flat, um, and the concepts there, those are so well entrenched now that you can't really reverse out of it. So you're going to see this, uh, excuse my um, my pun of wall building taking place of, <laughs> you know, populism, nationalism, and globalization all kind of competing with each other. Now you throw in another dimension on there of demographics. Um, demographics of age, industrial and lifestyle skill sets of service sector versus manufacturing sector of U.S. and Europe, uh, you know, kind of what we call the developed world, the up and coming regions of the Middle East and Asia. uh, And and we're talking everything from population sizes. We're talking everything from, um, you know, training and skill sets and backgrounds. And let's go to the most basic concepts of average age. I mean, If you did a graph, I think they just talked about this at the TED conference that's taking place, um, the 2017 TED conference in Vancouver right now, for 100 people living on Earth today, right, the preponderance of those people are actually in Asia, which is, which is just shocking, you know, um, and no one would do that. No one would, when you think about the repercussions of that from a economic standpoint, from a capital spending standpoint, from a religion standpoint, from an education standpoint, spending languages, you know, Chinese and Spanish versus English and Hindi and right. all of those pieces. I mean, the, the, the dramatic, the, the impacts are going to be dramatic. Now I'll throw in one more overlay onto there, which is something that really folks haven't thought about. Um, you kind of take it for granted, but the change is happening happening so rapidly is the is technology, mm-hmm. the, the incredible power of technology. And we initially started seeing it with communication and the internet. We saw it, the, the first stage was you know computers and the productivity growth we saw there. Then we saw the internet and the connectivity and the pull that's going to put together and that's that really was reflected in globalization and the speed of globalization the connections we have globally today um are like nothing we've ever had before and forget about email and forget about text messages but with the power of snapchat and facebook and instagram and you know the concept of the (laughs) a picture is worth a thousand words instantaneously is is one thing now think about the financial implications of whether it's global payments or financial independence that one can get from, you know, you actually have systems. I mean, we, we talk about situations in, in India and China where you can actually circumvent the bank account and people can have access to money through their mobile phones. Um, it's just unprecedented. And now think about even more so the, the rise of the individual versus the organization or the system The power of one person today to start a company and to build something that's never been built before and create something is greater than it ever has been in the in the age of human society. So all of these like metamorphic changes are taking place within the world. I mean, I I know I'm at very uh, a very high level in terms of ten or twenty thousand feet, but all of these things are going to affect 
markets and prices of risk assets and you're going to have companies that never existed before getting very large market capitalizations when snapchat is a good example of those you're going to see the demand from you know aging societies in the west uh, the need for fixed income assets and yields um, you're going to see new developments in real estate and infrastructure and the way people work and industries that are getting created that never seen before um, so it's really, really, really exciting, and and to some degree, and I think it's rightfully so, scary. You, you right? know, I was just about to say that I was going into that line that when you and I both worked on the street for the more traditional institutional place, the news you said probably would have scared me more than excited me. But from yes. where I sit today, I just got like jacked about all that stuff. I'm like, I was way more excited than 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 afraid. Um, yeah, no, it really is some incredible stuff. And what it does, you know, you're really going to challenge the the existing establishment, um, you know, whether it's education, whether it's where you live and what you have access to. The Internet and mobile communications is bringing access to opportunity like we've never had before. Yeah. And that that does a lot on for the 7.2 billion human beings that we have on the earth and everything from basic Access to clean water, clean sanitation, clean, you know, existence, electricity, to you know how commerce is done, to where people live, where people work, how they commute, um, how they communicate. I mean, it's just some really, really incredible things taking place. It is incredible, and, and you said you, you, I, who, I like got volleyballs and softballs coming up. I don't have to do any transitions here. You had mentioned in there, obviously, all the different access to to drinking water. And, and the different types of things. And I want to talk about a little bit about shaman and giving. Yes. Because the organizations that you're working with are helping to solve some of these problems. Share with us a little bit about who you're working with from the shaman and giving perspective and how that's affected you and what that means to you as well. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, I can talk at length about this, so you might have to cut me off. But I will. You Don't know, worry. What, 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 <laughs> you know, I've thought Keep a going. lot about you know how to do giving, how to do philanthropy. And there are so many different areas and segments. Um, and there was, you know, the area of poverty, of getting somebody to the basic level of sustenance and getting them, giving them, quote unquote, the opportunity to make a difference, just one person at a time. But how do you do that in a scalable fashion? And how do you do that in an efficient way to do it uh, in an efficient and effective and optimal way? Um, and I, you know, I, I was lucky enough to get to know two organizations that have been around somewhere between, you know, 15, 18 years. Um, one is a global organization called Acumen. It's actually based out of New York. Um, I've gotten to know them over the years based out of New York, but really got to know them in my time in India. The second organization is Dasra, which is an organization based in India that does primarily work in India, but is also kind of branching out and stuff. Um, they're very similar, but also very different. But really, they both take the next level of scalability in terms of, they really invest in budding entrepreneurial people, ideas, and concepts, um, and they invest in them. So the concept of impact investing um, on a patient basis of how can we do impact investing in a sustainable manner to help local entrepreneurs and businesses within the specific area Build something that is going to help that community, that area, that region, that group of people tackle a very specific aspect of poverty, whether it's going back to sanitation, whether it's clean running water, whether it's electricity, whether it's emergency primary care. And then you go to the next level of basic education. Can you get electricity, you know, places that you couldn't get electricity to? Can we do that through solar? Can we create a grid? Um, and also, really, it, you have these incredible people all around the world with all these great ideas, but how can you leverage them and how can you impact, um, you know, how can you get scale? So what these organizations do is they come in and they, they give you access to capital, which is obviously important, but then help you with strategy, how help you with how to fundraise, how to build infrastructure, how to think about a one-year, two-year, five-year, ten-year plan, how to make it commercially viable um, so that you're not just you know, giving somebody money. You're actually helping invest in themselves and in that community um, to build employment, to build sustainability and all of those different pieces. So 
Acumen does it very well. They do it in India. They do it in Pakistan. They do it in Latin America. They do it in Africa. They've recently kicked off a venture to do it in America, and it's just gotten some incredible traction and partnership, and the, the, their wins are just off the charts. Um, Dustra does it specifically in India, but they do partner with organizations like the Rockefeller Foundation, the Ford Foundation, um, to actually come in. And they're effectively – they're almost like consultants to these um, – nonprofit entities, which in India are specifically called NGOs, who come in and say, you know, you have this great idea. Let's write down the strategy. How do you build this? Let me consult you. Let me guide you. And for a lot of these entrepreneurs, they haven't had access to this, um, you know, given the environments that they grew up in, but they have these great ideas. So let's take this idea. Let's build on it. Let's iron out all of the different issues so you're not reinventing the wheel time and time again. Let's help you raise funding. And let's take it and scale it and let's get you some marketing and let's get you some branding and let's take it up to the next level. Right. So really incredible stuff. You know, I was I was going to say is it's a perfect fit because in the way that you strategically look at the globe, the the economy, and you think about it from that side in the sense of a strategic plan for the way that the economy is heading. The same thing that you've given for Shaman and Giving is you partnered with the people that are helping to provide that same strategy as well. And that's, Correct. and that's, and it's so in line with what you do. It's, it's, it's a nice fit. And I could see why they, there is a nice marriage there and how the, literally how there's a balance, a Shaman, a balance, uh, between the two. And, uh, it's, it's nice to see that understanding that their why and core for what, how they work is so much in line with you. It's a very powerful uh, juncture. Well, uh, that's exactly right. It it really is the concept of, you know, kind of can you get a collaborative compounding effect by everyone's actions? And that's really, if you think about it, what makes great societies and communities. And, you know, while we do have great entrepreneurs, nobody can do it alone, right? They need that traction and that, that momentum. And these organizations, just like in financial markets or anything like that, they need traction and momentum and direction. That's what these organizations help build. And it's really incredible when you see some of the results that they put together. That's great stuff. So what I like to ask uh, every one of our guests, because you are truly thriving and you're helping the world to thrive. Uh, Shaman is doing that. You're doing it. When you have trouble thriving, who do you seek out to help get you back on track? Lou Diamond. (laughs) <laughs> one answer and one answer only. No, you know, uh, once again, I am fortunate. I have a f- fantastic set of supporters. It obviously starts with my family, my wife and daughters, my parents. Um, it goes to a very, very core group of friends who are supportive. And, yeah, you know, let me tell you, as exciting and as challenging um, as this is, it is it is daunting. It is nerve wracking. Um, being an entrepreneur, I always say the only thing glamorous about being an entrepreneur is saying you're an entrepreneur. But <laughs> when you wake up at two o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the morning because you got to pay some bills and you don't know what Japan is doing and you don't know what's going on here and, and how are you going to do this? And sometimes you actually sit around and go. What the heck am I doing? What am I doing? You know, I could have just been sitting in my wonderful corporate job somewhere. Um, so it, it is the never-ending set of challenges and always the fear of the unknown. But, you know, there, that you also get a little bit of that adrenaline rush from that. That's, that's the challenge and, and building something hopefully one day bigger than yourself. You know, I'd, I'd actually say you're already doing it. Um, oh. and, and I'll even add to that. I'll speak with Alan. And, and what, what drew me to Shamana to help work with him um, in helping to get his message across or, or, or go through it is this sense of balance that he has in himself, as he just mentioned here. You know, he, he'll, he'll go in all the excitement and then the, the other minute, <laughs> well, what do I got to do in this piece? However, the thrivingness that you have is this ability to recognize how important this is from the bigger scope and being able to go 10,000, 12,000 feet up and look at the bigger things and how fortunate you've done. And I think that is to your core why you smile so much more when I see you. So either that or you're just <laughs> glad to see me, one of the two. <laughs> A little bit of both, buddy. No, no. <laughs> so if you were to give us one takeaway you want the Thrive Loud listeners to walk away from, what would that be today, Alan? You know, it's going to sound a little cheesy, but it it, it really is. It, bottom line is believe in yourself. Believe that you're here for a reason to make a difference and define that difference for yourself and go after it. Go and make it happen. Take the risk. 
Love it. Love it and live and breathe it every day. That's so it's it's right in line with what what I'm all about and uh, why why I love working with you, Alan. So how can oh, everybody, likewise, everybody how can everybody find you? Where are the, the sources, websites, social media, throw out the things so that they know where to seek out Alan Arakel and Shamana. The easiest ways is, uh, you know, we have a website for the fund, uh, the firm, I should say, shamanacapital.com, www.shamanacapital.com. And then um, for the giving is www.shamanagiving.org. And they both have emails on there to get in touch with us. Um, And, you know, I'd love to hear any ideas or thoughts. Alan, can't thank you enough for having you on the show today. It was a, a true pleasure and a lot of fun. We didn't bring the dogs in. We'll do that on, on a second <laughs> show, I think, for another yes. listen <laughs> on remote. And uh, thank you all, our, our listeners on Thrive Lab, for joining us. And until next week, keep thriving onward and upward. And remember, be brief, be bright, be gone. You've been listening to Thrive Loud with your host, Lou Diamond. Make sure to subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Thrive Loud or find us on the web at thrivepartners.net.